Hi, everybody. Welcome to New York Live Arts. My name is Janet Wong. I'm the Associate Artistic Director of New York Live Arts at the Bill T. Jones Annie Sane Company. Um, this is the very first Bill Chats of the season, and as you know, this one is called The Man in the Music. And this is at the end of a very exciting week, our season opener. Anna Teresa the Kiss, Mark and Salva Sanchez is at Love Supreme is in the theater downstairs, one more show. I hope some of you have seen it or are going to see it. Yes. Um, it's a very big honor for us to have the company in our space. Uh, she was last here in 1982 as one of our uh, Fresh Tracks artists. Back then this was still a uh, dance theater workshop. And uh, she was a 22-year-old student at NYU, Tisha NYU at the time. Um, t and today we have, uh, well, Bill will be in conversation with three very distinguished people from the jazz world. Um, and this is just the first of a series we will have in January, in conversation with Salman Rushdie. And uh, later in May we'll be with uh, Winter Marsalis. And the Bill T. Jones Anything Company will be at BAM next week, so please come and see that too. Um, Tonight, uh, today, this afternoon, uh, our guests are Ashley Kahn, um, music historian and producer and writer and educator. He wrote the book, A Love Supreme. Um, and we also have legendary bassist, Reggie Workman, who was uh, one of the ensemble members of, um, of John Coltrane's ensemble, actually prior to A Love Supreme. Uh, and he's also an educator, and he still performs at age 80. Um, just two weeks ago, 1 to 4 a.m., he told me. <laughs> That's how the cats roll, he told me that, too. And then we also have a surprise guest. Guest, um, Reggie invited a uh, legendary, another legend, pianist, John Lewis. So he'll be joining the conversation. Anyway, I'll let Bill introduce and, and tell you about who they are. And then uh, the conversation will flow, I'm sure. All right, gentlemen, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Dorothy Jones, and I can't say it's very um, great privilege, and it feels like I don't know what could happen. Just the conversations that we've been having backstage, so hold on to your seats. Um, I'm going to start by uh, Ashley Kahn is a Grammy-winning American music historian, journalist, producer, and educator. Uh, he's acclaimed for his books on the legendary recordings of two jazz icons, Miles Davis, Kanye Blue, and John Coltrane, of Love Supreme. And uh, Mr. Kahn will speak more about his accomplishments. And uh, the mystery man, who uh, I just had the pleasure of meeting, Mr. John Lewis, great uh, um, pianist, and who has, uh, are you, you took a master's degree at the, the Manhattan School of Music, is that true? USC, no. Uh -huh. Physics, yes, he's a, he, he's a physicist, as well as a great jazz player. But he'll, I'm sure he'll tell us more about his biography as we go on. And then there is uh, Professor Reggie Workman. He's an internationally acclaimed bassist, composer, educator, arts advocate, whose playing styles cover the range of modern music from bop to post-bop and beyond. Um, Workman's extensive performing and recording credits include performing with jazz icons, John Coltrane, Art Blakey, Jazz Messengers, Max Roach, Thelonious Monk, Abby Lincoln, Freddie Hubbard, Wayne Shorter, among many others. So, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much for being here. Great to be here, and thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Because this is on the occasion of the um, wonderful work of Anna Teresa de Kiersmacher downstairs in our theater, it's been quite a week, amazing. Uh, a work that struck me as being at its heart uh, deeply formal. I was going to open by asking, uh, we are told often that a love supreme is uh, evidence that John Coltrane was first and foremost a, a composer and a formalist. Does anybody want to talk about what do we mean by form and structure in terms of a love supreme? <laughs> it's been nominated, I think. Um, well, I, I, I did see the uh, performance yesterday, 
and I understand what you mean by formalism. And, uh, you know, of course, coming from the music world and understanding the source point of, of the uh, performance, um, I was constantly doing this sort of A-B comparison about what, the, what was happening in the music and what was happening on stage. Um, and having read some interviews with Aunt Teresa and Salva and where their inspiration came from and how they were, it, it, it seemed like it was less about um, the message or what John Coltrane's intention was with the music and much more the idea that it fit into a dance program. It was about 35 minutes long. It had different parts, and Love Supreme is a suite of four different sections, uh, each with its own sort of musical personality and energy and spirit. And uh, it opens and closes, it, it, and has this middle section too, so it has a kind of narrative. Mm -hmm. And that whole idea fits very well with any type of presentation, mm -hmm. any type of dramatic presentation. There was a lot of drama going on in there too. Um, so I was not in any way thinking about it in that sense, except the idea of a general structure and the idea that it supplied this to, to the dance company. And it reminded me of um, in, when I was doing my book on Love Supreme, the one bit of contention that I kept hearing between different uh, musicians was the, were those who were very much... Um, uh, uh, reverent. There was this reverence of Battle of Supreme being this uh, complete statement that should only be performed as a complete statement in all four parts versus other musicians who looked upon it simply as musical material like uh, Branford Marsalis, for example, uh, the saxophonist who felt, feels that if he wants to perform the second part, Resolution, in a gig on Tuesday night, he should be able to pull it out of the bag mm -hmm. and hit the stage with it and then go on to another, to Body and Soul, or mm -hmm. one of its originals. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Reggie, uh, do you make a distinction between what we call jazz and what we call improvisational music? Well, you're saying two things, they're one and the same. Mm -hmm. and, well, uh, well, uh, well, so they're interchangeable for you. Yeah, basically improvisational music is, is no different from uh, the fact that we're here talking about uh, a subject and uh, you have a subject when you deal with improvisation, you have a subject when you come to uh, whatever you were talking about and everybody makes a contribution and gets something from it. Uh, I neglect the word uh, jazz. I would rather not use that. I would rather use African American music because that has a land base and a cultural base. And <coughs> you understand. Well, could you speak to that? You said a land base and a cultural base. What do you mean by that? Well, if you say jazz, what country does that represent? If you say Indian music, what country? If you say Japanese, if you say no theater, or if you say Raba, mm -hmm. if you say March, if you say Sousa, they all represent a company. Where is jazz? Mm. Where is that on the map? Okay, so we have been talking about what, I don't want to belabor that point because we've been doing it for so many years. Uh, we need to, to have our young people who are coming along behind us have a strong educational, a strong base for what they're studying. Mm -hmm. Like you, you, don't, uh, you don't go into uh, physics and not understand algebra, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. So, that's you know, one reason that uh, I had, because you are brushing up very closely to something I thought we'd have to work up to, uh, because as you, uh, as you know, we live in a um, identity riddled era, and there's a lot of, of hard feelings out there around um, the differences between people. And um, we, but what we read all the time is that a love supreme transcends. It transcends all questions of earthly questions in a way that of race being one of them and African American. So I'm, I'm, I appreciate you jumping in here uh, with that, but uh, I'd like to return to it if we could at a, a later point because I have a question about Kate. Uh, and there's a mistake I'm going to make many times tonight. 
John Cage, John Coltrane, mm -hmm. and because I've been sort of uh, immersed in both of them, but maybe we could come back to this question of his politics, or maybe your politics, or the politics of jazz. Yes, John. I'd like to uh, introduce something. Now, the only two fields in the world is, that are exact is music and mathematics. John Coltrane, see, I knew John. Now, I played with him before Reggie. Let me say that. And we're gonna get a lot of this. He looks, he looks, he looks good, but he don't look as good as us. <laughs> now, just because you, I didn't make the albums with him doesn't mean, but I got the tapes of it. Those are albums. Okay, you got your credentials. And I, I got, have, and I have, yeah. you know, I have my own record company since 1950. So. Yeah. <laughs> now, what I'm, what I'm saying is this, physics and math are only exact sciences in the world. Mm -hmm. That's why we say constant is change. And John Coltrane, Little Supreme, was part of that. Mm -hmm. That's all. And for you, it is, it is uh, what did you call it, Reggie? Black, uh, uh, you said African-American music. music. Yes. That's, that's what, what was you said. That's what you yeah. it's, Back to that, and also like to you know dovetail something that you was talking about right now. But to continue your sentence, uh, I have okay. And the reason I'm saying that, you know, labels, mm -hmm. like in you know different subjects, they're they're problematic. They're problematic. Mm -hmm. When my father used to write a prescription, give it to the apothecary, silic, silic, silic acid. Mm -hmm. We know what that is, don't we? Aspirin. We have any doctors in the audience? Okay, it's aspirin. It's aspirin. Mm -hmm. Why do we? That's why we don't like the word jazz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so he's trying to peer, spearhead it. No, I, and I appreciate that. And I, see, but I appreciate artists that. need to stand up, like Charlie Mingus, Max Roach, mm -hmm. and say, no, Duke Ellington. He said, I, what did he say? I just, I just play music. Two kinds of music, good and bad. No, no, you're wrong. Oh. No, no, watch it. No, 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 watch it. Okay, sorry, sorry. What's it? It's only two types. Why do you think we tune up in tune, out of tune? Mm -hmm. Oh, in tune, out of tune. Ah, I see. Huh. Am I saying something wrong now? <laughs> you have to Reggie. Reggie, did you want to come back or you want to come back? You got something you want to well, say? Well, you know, there's so many important things are said. Once we start talking, uh, the spirits enter us and we utter words that we don't even know where they're coming from. For example, uh, we're all talking about spirituality and we're talking about universal law. And uh, we're talking about the power points and we're talking about the major points. And you said John Cage, John Coltrane, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, we're talking about music, math, many. All, if you look at all the power words on the fulcrum, you understand why the masters who created the language in order to control the psychological mind uh, use certain invocations with the Latinized code, the, the, the uh, 26,000 year alphabet that we speak from. And uh, all of those things require uh, some study and some thought in order to really understand what we do when we utter a word or when we shape our voice or our muscles to, to speak and uh, make an invocation. And you compare the literal words and the verbal words to the musical sound and understand uh, that they're all coming under the invocation of the, the fulcrum, which is number 13, which is M revolved. 180 degrees, uh, you, you know that all of these things are related. And uh, we, I'm very happy that everyone is here interested in thinking about these things. And, and I want to relate my statements to uh, what we first started talking about, uh, the choreography and the piece of Love Supreme. And uh, the fact that uh, Mr. Coltrane, when he went over his, according to Ashley Khan's interview with Turia, when he went over to over top of the garage and started working on the piece, 
it reminded me when I saw the piece a couple of nights ago of John when the first actor came out representing John Coltrane, first dancer rather, representing John Coltrane and moving in a small space and contemplating and you could see something in his movement and in what happened and not to say that this is what the choreographer had in mind but to me it invoked the fact that John went to study himself and to study what he wanted to do with this particular piece of music. And then actually gave us something in his book that said that Turia told him that John came down and said, well, I finally got my idea together, what I want to do. I finally know. Actually, you should take it from there because yeah, you know, I, I just hope we're not spoiling it for anyone tonight. <laughs> That's a little bit of a spoiler as to how the... the how many people have seen the piece? Ah, well, this is a very esoteric conversation for you. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Who, who's going to see it tonight? Okay, then I'm. Um, the, uh, Reg is referring to the opening part, and I won't say anything more about it, except to say that we, you know, it's something for you to think about when you see it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, I, you know, I, I, I love the improvisation question you asked because mm -hmm. that certainly was a point of connection between what I saw with the dance. And um, uh, and of course, jazz in general, mm -hmm. you know, African American music of that style, improvised. But the the idea that jazz, you know, uh, or what we call jazz, utilizes improvisatory elements is just part of the picture. Mm -hmm. You know, and there are many many musical traditions around the globe that include yes. improvisation. Yes. But one thing that I've found again and again with my students at, at NYU is that when I use the word improvisation, mm -hmm. you know, and that's something that applies as much to hip hop and, and comedy as it does to, uh, to, to the jazz tradition, is the idea that um, when you th hear the word improvisation, what you should really be hearing and thinking about is intense preparation. Mm -hmm. The idea that anyone who's improvising is actually bringing a hell of a lot of experience onto the stage with them. And in that experience are hours and then hours of, of working out all sorts of devices and approaches to their art, to their craft. Well, thank you. Um, you know, uh, Reggie, uh, Reggie, uh, Ron Carter, I, I interviewed recently, you'll like this story, and I was asking him about the Miles Davis. Ron Carter, uh, for those of you maybe Okay, the bassist Ron Carter, who's probably most famous at the beginning of his career for being part of the Miles Davis Quintet, the same one that Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter came out of in the 1960s. Excuse, no, excuse me, no, he became famous when he was working at me with with Jillies when I was working with uh, Frank Sinatra. That's when he, I, 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 when, I he stand first, when he when he first started playing. He wasn't with Miles in. He was That's with, right. He was with me. That's right. Well, he became famous. He became right. famous. Yes. Anyway, Ron Carter. I was asking him about the Miles Davis Quintet, and he said, "When when people think we were just improvising, doing it on the spot, I was actually remembering something that happened the Tuesday before." and that I then developed on Wednesday, and that Herbie had reminded me of with something he played, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole idea of improvisation is not just pulling it out of the, your pocket, mm -hmm. but the idea that there's a hell of a lot of experience and kind of uh, decision-making that has gone into that. Yes. And so that kind of preparation is why we enjoy a performance mm -hmm. because we rely on the improviser to have this incredibly vast vocabulary that they can draw upon and make it work right in the moment. Right, right, right. Um, well, I mean, maybe I'm uh, going down a little too deep in this, but what did these ideas, uh, what did form and structure mean to John Coltrane? And who or what were his models? One more time. What did form and structure mean to John Coltrane? And who or what were his models? Well, actually, you're asking, uh, asking, us to, asking us to give you the same thing that Ashley just gave you. Uh, form and structure uh, is, is a part of what we're all about. 
uh, if you notice, if you really have studied John Coltrane, if you really have listened to his music and followed him over the years, you know that he was one who worked with all the big bands. He worked with the blues. He's from North Carolina, down south. He has a greasy spoon where he used to go and have his lunch and everything. And he studied. He went to the Sandoli Brothers thing when he came to Philadelphia with his mom. Uh, he studied as we all study our crafts and deal with the patterns. If anyone has seen the graph, the, the, the circular graph that he made when he talked about his cycle of fists, uh, which I think is, might be online by now, uh, he was about patterns. He was constantly studying patterns. And I'm sorry that you didn't get a chance to hear the whole interview with Kosky because Kosky asked him during the interview about patterns and about the things that he was studying. He was reluctant to answer, but somewhere in that conversation he talked about the patterns that he was constantly working with. And uh, toward the end of that conversation he said, I'm still working at it. I have to know myself. Once I get that together, I'll leave it at that. And at that point in his life, he was still studying the patterns and still working on the same patterns that we all work on in order to achieve what we are achieving, whether you be a writer, whether you be a dancer, a choreographer, or a graphic artist, or whatever you do. Uh, we have a, a force. We have a north and south pole. We have a, a negative and positive. We have a universal law. We have a spheric evolution. And, and we're all related to that. Mm -hmm. And that's what drives us all. And once we find out we're all connected that way, I think the world will be a different place. So gentlemen, uh, let me get these questions out of the way. They might, I think we're covering such wonderful things are being said, but uh, Love Supreme is described as a milestone, landmark in 20th century music. Now that's kind of that's an amazing statement, right? Um, then why? Why is it considered a landmark? milestone because, because the world marketed it and one more time please they marketed it because it was marketed, marketed it. yes it's a, it's a lot of milestones out there that they haven't touched ah. a lot of things he's written they haven't touched mm -hmm. a lot of things he's done well you know let, let me, let me they push, haven't touched but John let me push back just a little bit there was many people were doing uh, through Let's go to the visual arts for a moment. There were various traditions where people were taking bits of things and putting them together. And then um, a person, uh, uh, Brock, uh, later Picasso, um, uh, they began to uh, focus on what we now call collage as a form. So there are certain seminal collages that we say were very, very important. Cubism. We can all understand that the world is made of planes and so on. What was there when those when uh, Picasso and Brock uh, were making those early um, Cubist canvases? The world had not seen anything like it. So this is what I hear when I hear that it is a landmark. Yes, there are there are a lot of good works out there, but which ones changed the game? And it was my understanding that Love Supreme changed the game in the way that Picasso and Brock changed um, with, with Cubism. Am I off base here? No, you're right on because the train is an extension of all the ones that he, he has heard. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. we all come from somewhere, you're saying, and right? That's what he's talking about, about yes. the circle, the fifths. Mm -hmm. See, he heard it. It didn't just come out the sky. Mm -hmm. But nobody had played this way before. Right? Yes, they have. Have you ever heard of Buster Smith who taught Charlie Parker? He never got they claim. Mm. Have you ever heard of Buster Smith? No, I have not. Well, that's why I asked the question, who or what were his Exten models? Extension, extension. That's why I have a TV show to talk about these gentlemen. Mm -hmm. That's why I had Ira Gittler on to talk about him. Because Ira, Ira Gittler, you know, he was a what, saxophone player. Yeah, you know, he played, but he was a beautiful writer with downbeat. Okay, there was a name just dropped right now. Are there other names that we might, those of us, go and jump on Wikipedia and find that John, no, they, John, they, John Coltrane was actually learning from specific artists? Any other names that we should know? Were you in the first grade? 
Uh, yes, I was. And I was where everybody was, hopefully. Yeah. Yes, yes. There were teachers that told me, man, that, oh my goodness. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. No, they're known to us. Mm -hmm. They're not known to them. Well, give me a name. Phyllis Wheatley. The poet. And yeah. she was a brilliant pianist. Uh, I'm confusing her with, I, the, with the, uh, the 19th century uh, poet. Yes, uh, yes. And she was a pianist. I went, to, I went to grammar school. She was a pianist. Yes, okay, but what did he get from her? What's that? What did he get from her? By, by listening, by listening mm -hmm. to her writings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he turned it into rhythm. Do you have anything? Uh, am I, is this a, block, a dead end? Yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm going to jump back to your uh, question about why is it a, you know, considered a masterpiece. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you both the sort of Wikipedia answer and, and what I feel is like an emotional way of understanding it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel that uh, this is one of those um, recordings where uh, it just hit at the right time in 1965 when it was released. And the world was kind of bringing down dividers between genres and uh, generations, etc. And a whole new generation of uh, people who were kind of raised on rock and raised in R&B were suddenly listening to jazz and vice versa. Um, and uh, it appeared at the right time with the right message. The idea of universal love, the idea of a love supreme, um, all of you guys, I think, have the liner notes in your uh, program notes for this talk. So you can see he's speaking in a very open but non-religious spiritual way and trying to embrace an idea that would become very popular when the Beatles went over to India to study transcendental meditation. Uh, by the end of the 60s, every music star had a guru, had a swami. So there was a lot of spiritual exploration going on at that time. So the, this, I mean, Miles Davis in his book, in his uh, autobiography, talks about how a love supreme connected at just the right time. And the people who have been writing music, popular music history, all kind of came out of that era. And so Kind of Blue from Miles D Davis and Love Supreme from John Coltrane are kind of up there along with the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, etc., as some of the most popular music of all time. Um, in addition, John Coltrane stepped forward and stepped out of this kind of cool aesthetic of what jazz was about and kind of did this public disrobing of like, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. I am the spiritual being this is what I want my music to do. Nobody had ever talked about jazz music as being you know, a way of conveying this gift to God as, a, as, as addressing the divine. But he did it in such a way that it invited people in. It wasn't purely from a Judeo-Christian kind of sensibility. In fact, it was more Eastern in the way that uh, if you read his poem. And at the same time, you know, the music itself feels like a religious experience. Mm -hmm. There is this, this uh, deep gospel kind of feel that's coming out of the music itself, which we, is unmistakable. Excuse me, before we go close more in the spiritual direction, uh, reading uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Porter's book, uh, and he's talking about harmonics, and he makes a lot out of uh, uh, Coltrane's rigorous exploration of harmonics. Uh, for those of us who don't understand the technicality, can someone give us a primer? And what, what was this about his harmonics that was so groundbreaking? Uh, if, if I may, uh, he was exploring harmonics with regard to his instrument and how he could relate to the harmonics to what he was playing, what he was dealing with as far as his music was concerned. For example, he would deal with one note and then he would perform what the extension of that note with regard to the harmonics. And when he was talking about harmonics, he wasn't just talking about harmonics as far as the reed or the saxophone was concerned. He was talking about harmonics as far as his knowledge of what was harmony, what was harmony according to what he was trying to achieve and what path he was going to take. 
Uh, so the word harmonic takes on a different meaning, I think, if I may answer it. Please, please. please. Get inside his mind. Uh, again, I would like to say like, we all have traveled with him. We listen to all the complex things he has done and performed and, and what he has dealt with over the years and, and we see that how advanced he was. But by the time he got to a love supreme, he was involved with discarding anything that was not necessary and dealing with what was most important. And what was most important to him was finding himself, knowing who he is, getting to his core, his center, getting to the energy that is responsible for us all. And that way he felt he could relate to all people. And if uh, you heard that uh, announcement, uh, rather that interview, the first thing he says, I hope they enjoy it, I hope they understand it. I hope they understand what I'm saying and what I'm dealing with because that's what I'm, that's the point I'm trying to get across. Well, but every artist feels that, particularly when you're taking chances. Every artist does. I hope uh, so. Yeah, no, but there, there's something here I'm really resisting because uh, one thing I have heard is that uh, People are so pulled into the allure of his spirituality and mm -hmm. his message. A person like uh, and uh, Lewis Porter says that we forget that he was a composer. And it was not all his religion on stage. He said that it was actually, he was uh, right there with Stravinsky and others talking about dissonance, talking about sound and so on. Uh, that's all I'm, I'm, I'm saying. I, I think I definitely agree. That's, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do these talks, because I thought when you come to the US with Love Supreme, Love Supreme is in some ways all, almost a religious text for many people. But others say, well, hold on, religious text, yes. But it's also, this is a person who is changing Western composition. Um, now, maybe that is, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's why I'm pushing this idea. Harmonics, duration. Um, why does it land on the ear oftentimes in what sounds like, a, like an assault? What was going on there uh, as a music? But, um, anybody want to take that up? There's something that you can't explain. Yeah. Oh, books are written, though. No, no, the book is that someone's. That's, that's their idea. You have to feel it. Mm -hmm. I'm not a religious person, okay? Mm -hmm. But I know this, it was the creator. And I look in the mirror and say, and this is music, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, so you're talking about spirituality. I look in the mirror. No, I was trying not to talk about spirituality. Yeah, okay. I was trying but, to talk about music. But I'm, I'm gonna talk about music. And okay. that's why I, play. I look in the mirror and say, God, thank you for opening my eyes and I wink. <laughs> and I get a chill, then I sit at the piano, man, and I play something different every time. Mm -hmm. You can't explain something like that. Mm -hmm. Miles said, you can't. Look, Miles, is, he talks to me in a different way than he would talk to you. Mm -hmm. He's heard, he heard the tapes. Mm -hmm. Don't you understand? So this, he said, why does everybody ask the same questions? When I was interviewing, I said, well, this is going to be different. Mm -hmm. And it was. And it's, it's selling like hotcakes. Yes, right. See, Miles wouldn't like you mm -hmm. right now. He, he would what? He wouldn't like you because you ask the same question everybody else asks. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mingus yeah. wouldn't like you either. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not here to be liked. Yeah, I know. Yes, but I'm here to. I'm but I like you. Yeah, I'm very glad. <laughs> but I'm just talking that. about the I'm artist. Really glad. No, right. train, train. Does, he didn't really like uh, being interviewed. Right, and that's why we have the privilege of talking about the work of a great master, and we want to speak about it from different points of view. I, I am, I know what, I know what the black church is. Oh, really? Yes, I do. I have a mother who could throw down at the, uh, uh, I had the mother who could throw down at the, at the drop of the hat, and she could connect with her God. So. If, uh, black folks can do this. I did it through the mirror. I do it through the mirror every morning. And yeah, you chill. I, yeah, you chill. but you understand what I'm saying. I understand so you. that so that aspect of it is less amazing that a black musician, a genius like he, could actually uh, strive for God in public. It is the technique of how he got there. That and this is what I this is what I was 
If we, if you don't really want to go there, but this I, is what I. Just what you said about genius, may I say this? May I? May I say this? Because I, I've been laying back, and you, you, you professors here, you, you professors here, you professing. Okay. Now Charlie. wait a minute. Now I asked Charlie Parker. They, they would run up to Charlie Parker and say, "Oh, you a genius," and Parker would say, and, and Max, and he, because <laughs> Charlie had fun with the audience. And he would ask, are you one? They say, no. How do you recognize one then? <laughs> what? One what? Genius. Oh, genius. Ah. You say, and you saying that this person is a genius. How do you recognize? Are you one? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, we use the words loosely. <laughs> and that's our problem. In the music field, in every field, in every medicine, every field. Uh, Ashley, do you want to jump in here? Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, you know, the, the point that you're making, absolutely you know, is, is, is very valid. I mean, John Coltrane, I mean, the quote that you've got from Louis Porter there was, was perfect because, you know, he serves many roles to many people 50 years after he passed. He passed in 1967, here it is, 50 years later, and we're still talking about him as if he was right here with us still. And his music is, I mean, it's timeless stuff. Um, he was an autodidact, he taught himself about Eastern philosophy, he taught himself about music as well. He went to school for music, and he was very dedicated about the uh, understanding nuts and bolts of music theory. So when you say harmonics, I think music theory is really what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Reggie mentioned the idea of the circle of fifths, which was a diagram which was very mathematically involved, where he created a sort of intervallic relationship map, a way of thinking about musical harmony and how to use that within jazz performance. Nobody really got, got under the hood of the music that deeply as, as, as just Most Coltrane. of us don't even know how to begin. Yes, okay. excuse exactly. me, I, excuse know. me, I disagree with that. No, hold on, he, but he's got the floor now. No, I know, but I say I disagree, so he, he okay. may finish. All right, go ahead and finish. Right. No, you know, no, no. Before, before he was born, man, it was happening. Before he was born, Duke, Duke Ellington. Look, I can name Blind Sam, probably you don't know who it is. Art Tatum. No, before Art Tatum. So your point, your point is, as you've made several times tonight, is that nothing is, quote, original. The new under the sun. Okay. There, there is nothing new under the sun. I absolutely agree. What I'm saying is that what set John Coltrane apart is this dedication to understanding music on a very, very strong academic he, level. He's part of the nucleus, man, that's all. Uh, and I, I'm not debating, well, John is not you, uh, you said you a great term, musician. You I'm talking about. We're not debating that. Yeah, I'm not no, debating no, no, we're not debating that. Uh, you mentioned it, you use the term on an academic level. What, what do you mean by that? I mean he's very studious. He was him and John, and and Miles would give themselves uh, musical problems to mm -hmm. work through. Mm -hmm. Blue and Green, the opening of Blue and Green and Kind of Blue was a little musical problem that mm -hmm. was sketched out on a matchbook that Miles Davis gave to the pianist Bill Evans. Mm. And later on he said, okay, here's how we get from this chord to this chord to that chord. And this gorgeous thing of beauty was created, mm. you know, with uh, Miles's muted trumpet, et cetera. Check out Blue and Green on, on the Kind of Blue album and you'll see that that's where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Or you take something like uh, Giant Steps, one of the most covered jazz tunes of uh, modern day. And that came from an idea of problem solving that John Coltrane approached his music with. Um, problem and, solving, something very big in our contemporary uh, dance world. Yeah. Uh, very, very, very important. Task-based choreography uh, with a whole generation of persons. And I don't think a lot of us knew that, um, let's say I came into the dance world in the, in the early 70s. And I think I, my um, Forebears were people who were working probably around the time that Cage was starting. I, I'm sorry, Coltrane was starting. <laughs> Why is he leave, won't leave me alone today? But um, the, and therefore, this idea of chance, this idea of, of task-based work, well, right. was in the um, in the DNA of the culture and the artistic conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Is it important to know uh, Coltrane's biography to appreciate his accomplishment in Left Supreme? No? Is it important to understand his biography to appreciate his love, his uh, contribution? It's his feeling. It's his music. feeling. Feeling the music, yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. See, you know, I love this gentleman here. Someone gave me his, <laughs> his book for my birthday. I, first time I met him, and he's, he's intellectual. You know, I, I, li I like that. Mm -hmm. I'm somewhat that too, somewhat. <laughs> but man, academically, you cannot talk your way into music, man. And who's great, who's not. You know, I'm talking, there's too much music out there in the world. Like Ming is but thinking, but John, Ming has said he hears music when he listens to the trees, man. No, is, that, is that academic? Of course, of course. Thinking is also fun, though. No, I didn't, I'm, not, I'm not debating that. Uh, but I mean, I feel that we just can't that. lay and talk about well, John. That is not all we're doing. John Coltrane wasn't academic at all. Aha. Uh -huh. Reggie, you agree with that? John Coltrane was not academic at all? Well, it depends on how you Microphone, explain. please. It depends on how you explain academic. John Coltrane, uh, just for your information, <clears throat> you used to come home from work and sit in his hotel room with books after books after books in between his legs with his saxophone practicing notes and reading about all parts of the world and all parts of history mm -hmm. and learning about every culture and learning about every type of music that you, that you could think of. Mm -hmm. And uh, you may not, you may call that academics, but or you may not, but he's just, Exploring his mind. Yeah, he's studious. He, he was a he's student. Doing what he does, and that's again. I say, if you listen to his music and listen to all the things that he has created over the years, and come, we come to a love supreme, which is like the complexity of simplicity. Mm -hmm. You know, like he, you know that he has experienced all the same things that uh, all of the other scholars or all the other learned people have done. Uh, and yet, he wants to find what is the essence of everything that I have studied. What is the essence of it, and, and how can I convey that to not just the people of this area, but all the people in the universe? Now, Reggie, one reason I ask that question, uh, which might be a, a hackneyed question, but it's, it's always on the mind of persons. Um, we, uh, I think there was a big stink a few years back around Ken Burns' documentary on jazz. And the critique was that it was an old, uh, that jazz people fell into um, a decadent phase, they had to struggle, many died, and out of this great um, stripping away and torture came genius. Uh, so that's why I'm asking, is it important to know his biography to appreciate the accomplishment of love supreme? Uh, I wouldn't say you have to know his biography to appreciate the accomplishment, because uh, that is not the, the situation you have to study everything about him in order to know what he's trying to convey. I think that we all have a, a concept. When we hear a note, uh, I know Ornett used to tell me, uh, how do you hear this E flat? Ornett, Ornett Coleman. Ornett Coleman used mm -hmm. to tell me, how do you hear this E flat? And I would tell him how I hear it, but then he would t l tell me to listen to it in different ways in relation to this particular note, in relation to this particular interval. Mm -hmm. then, uh, it, therefore, it sounds different. Uh, the how does the average person hear a particular texture, mm -hmm. uh, and universally, I, I will try to bring the audience into this because this is something that I know works, and this is something that I've been taught is real, and that is, uh, let me do this, I'm trying to bring you guys all into this particular thing. I'm walking into the room, and you're all listening, looking to see what I'm going to do for the first part of my talk. There's a blackboard here, and you're waiting to see what I do. I take my fingernails, and I scratch Use your mic, please. down the blackboard 
I scratch down the backboard this way. Now, I do not have to ask how you feel because I know that some of you felt that feeling here. <laughs> Universally, I know that we have been taught that there's a certain thing about scratching down a blackboard with your fingernails that causes you to feel a certain way. The musician has to understand things like that in order to know what texture he's using with his instrument and how he's reaching people and how that note or that scream makes the people feel. And then once I understand that, what do I do with it? And where do I take it from there? That is a, a, the complexity of simplicity. You know, there are so many things that go beyond the, the spoken word and, and what we're dealing with as far as the sound is concerned. Uh, and there's so much studying that has to do. When I would sit down with Sun Ra, and he, he would tell me things like, oh, you have to learn to unlearn, which answers your question about do you have to know his biography in order to understand what he's saying. Mm -hmm. uh, many well, of I'm, my well, what, I, what I meant by that was if I heard Love Supreme, let's say I, I've been on a mountaintop somewhere, mm -hmm. do I need to know that it was an African-American man made this in 1964 in a country that was trying to get out from beneath the, the yoke of apartheid, that um, there was all sorts of disagreement with the power structure around the world. The world was, and uh, I mean, do I, I, I think we all are enriched by being able to understand the context of the work. Uh, that's, what, that's the only reason I ask that. Um, did you want to say something, Ashley? Um, I think it's been said. Okay, um, one last before we open it up to our, to our audience here. Uh, what were Coltrane's politics and are they at play in A Love Supreme? What were his politics and are they at play in Love Supreme? I, I, don't, I, don't, I think you're simplifying the, the creation. I think you're simplifying the, the reality of the science of sound. Mm -hmm. which is another way of saying we, the musicians, we are sound scientists. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and you're simplifying the fact that he's dealing with the creation of the, of the patterns that you ask us about in order to accomplish certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, um, if you look at uh, people like Dali, mm -hmm. and you mentioned Picasso, and you look at uh, people like uh, uh, not Takemitsu, mm -hmm. and, or, or you listen to uh, people uh, who have dealt with, uh, with the sound, science of sound, mm -hmm. and, and you understand how that relates to our universal law. I think that... Well, we'll I, I think, I, I respectfully say that, no, I don't think it's a simple question anymore, because it is true that we all have two arms, two legs. It's true that there's a thing called space. However, when certain bodies move through space, depending on who the audience is, there is a distinctly different way of thinking about it. Nothing is neutral. So my point is, and, and I call that the politics of the body. I call it the politics of space. Who is allowed to perform? How old are you? Are you a male? Are you a female? Are you transgender? Are you, um, are you obviously a gay person? Are you black? Are you white? All of those things, I believe, are political expressions. And I'm asking, does his, uh, what were Coltrane's politics? This was done in 1964, right? The Civil Rights Act, right? It was, this is happening at that time civil rights struggle, all of those things were happening. You can say he was an apolitical person. You can say it, but tell me, did he, what was his connection to what was going on? What were his, what were his politics? And is it in the music? Well, you know, uh, jumping over a lot of things and getting to the end of Kosky's interview, uh, at the end of that interview, he answered Kosky, he said, uh, I want to be a force for real good. For good or for change? For real good. 
he said, he, that was his expression, uh, if you say it's politics. Well, what do you think he, he meant by the real good? Uh, he, well, he explained it to me, uh, uh, to Kosky, when he said, uh, I know that there are good forces, there are bad forces, there are all kinds of forces, but I want to be a force of good. And I'm not going to let you go with that, though. And, uh, that's, too, that's, that's too simple. What do you mean good, right? What do you mean? Was he, was he, uh, did he believe that there was good and evil? There were, did he believe in sin? Did he that's believe he, all those things? That's what he said. He said, he said, I know there are good and evil. No, but what do we evil. mean by good? Let's just, just indulge me for a moment. What, say, was he a progressive? Or was he not concerned? It, the, it was 1964. What do you mean by good? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Um, That's I, why I'm asking. I, know, I, I got, got some. Uh, I got some for 1950. If you say something, what do you mean by good? Uh, it could mean different things. To I different know it people. could, but what do you think it meant for him? You knew him, right? I knew him. Yes. The train told me something. 1950. Yeah. Tell me. 1949. Tell me now. Yes. He said we come in this world. What we do in between positive or negatively, and then we die. This is clarify your point. He said, hopefully, the positives overweighted negatives. That's how he thought. Those words are inadequate now, positive and negative. No, he said, hopefully, the positives, I heard and you. then I we heard die, you. then we die. I heard Because no heard. one's perfect. I, no, but I think, I think we have to be a little bit more, particularly in a world right now where this particular country controls most of the world's natural resources. We have a serious problem uh, that has never been addressed in the country. The young people, John Coltrane's grandchildren, I'm just a union, they're out in the street saying, Black Lives Matter, police brutality. They're out in the street saying these things. Women think differently about their bodies. Uh, women do not want to be objects of men. Women want to be agents. All of these things, we, are, we cannot just say, be better. What do we mean? What did he mean? I'm telling you what he said. I know what he said. But no, I, I think I'm asking you. Did what you he, hear it in that? I did. Did you hear, hear that version? I, I am asking you, what did he mean by positive? No, he said hopefully. Because we're going through the same changes that we went through in the 20s and the 1800s. Okay. Was he aware? He, he was aware that this, this is not the wagon train days anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he knew that. Yeah, I don't and okay. he was he was striving through his music, man. Let's put it this way: when I listened to the music at the university, what I heard was screaming and protest. Yeah, I heard protest. Protest against what? You're Same not thing. Talking about love supreme. Pardon? You're not talking about love okay, supreme. Okay, no, you're actually you're talking about other cultures. Uh, attention to some of those other. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. But I, he was. I think the musical genius was there, but it was something that was trying to be communicated that was depending on your point of view, inchoate or absolutely clear. All oh, musicians do that, man. They, they're projecting. They hope the audience would like it. OK. I want to ask I you a question. The, yes. Uh, when you said you listened to the music in the 60s, why? Well, no, not in the 60s. I was listening to it in the 70s. In the 70s, and you heard screaming and protests. Is that what you I just thought said? that that's what I heard with some of the uh, more outside. Even that uh, performance that he did, there's one recorded live performance, correct? Was it in France that it was done? I know it's there are many recorded but, performances. But videotaped. Yeah, there is a handful. OK, but at the end of the tape, uh, St. John Coltrane, right? There is a short snippet showing him on stage. And he is going at it. And people were leaving. People were upset. You know, He was going at it. It sounded, you could say, uh, it was angry, uh, or it was, well, what was it? And, I, and I'm thinking, it's only a question, gentlemen. It's only a question. How was he connecting with the fervor of his era? Was he? Because he, yeah, was he? You can say no. You can say he was a, he's part of that environment, what was going on during those years. You had to be infected. I don't, know, that. I don't know if, they're true, if that's true. There are certain people who said, I have nothing to do with that. It meant I am making my work. There's no perfection. You know that. I didn't say it was perfection. It's a choice. He has the right to feel that way. 
express himself. Mingus did the same thing. A lot of musicians did the same thing. Elmer Coleman, Arden Coleman did the same thing. I understand. There are musicians that you don't know did it in the 20s. And people are doing it. And they're still doing it. Women are still screaming. They, they don't, they get, what? I was what? trying to talk about him. I'm just making an analogy. I they, understand. They're understand. still screaming today. Yes. Everyone is screaming. Everybody's artist in the, in mm -hmm. the world. But he gave us permission in a certain way to do it in art. Oh, no. No, no, man. You know, Bill, what, what you're asking about is, um, um, you know, everybody hears in music what they bring in mm -hmm. themselves. That's, that's always there, okay? John Coltrane was very clear at very certain points in interviews that he did that he was not angry, that if he was angry at all, it was at himself because he couldn't achieve a certain musical goal that he was trying to get at in a solo that he was taking on a Tuesday night in Stockholm in 1960, mm -hmm. you know, and I think actually that's where he actually talks about the idea that his emotion is his emotion, you know, mm -hmm. that what he is doing is much more about the musical detail and his focus is on the music. It's not about trying to reflect the political outrage. Or there was the no critique in it. But let me finish, you mm -hmm. know, the idea of political outrage and the music reflecting that usually comes much more from the listener than the musician, especially in the world of instrumental music. And especially in the case of John Coltrane. I've done multiple interviews with musicians who were listening in the 60s, and they heard exactly what you heard. Carlos Santana, Roger McGuinn from The Birds, etc. They heard the outrage that they wanted to hear okay. in the music. I, my question was, as was, far he, as the was, politics, it apolitical? was he apolitical? No, he was not. He That's was, why I asked you, what were his okay, politics? Okay, well then, let me answer. Yeah. You know, I mean, basically what he's saying, you know, what he said in his interviews um, was that he was very aware of the politics at the time. I've talked to Mrs. Coltrane, Taria, that, and she talked about how that, you know, when, when, the, uh, uh, when the, uh, the riots were going on in 1963, mm -hmm. which really was the first, you know, spark of what would later come with the uh, with the uh, you know Black Panthers etc., there was a lot of concern between him and various other family members, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of conversation going on about that. But that was true throughout you know African American communities at the time. I'm sure, you know. So but he what was very was his aware. relationship to it. You know what, I'll, I'll just say again that, you know, we tend to look at music mm -hmm. and I, I, one, of the, one of the things that, uh, credos that I have as a music journalist, as a music historian, is that ultimately I try and look at music as it is, not what I want it to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's okay. really, you Well, know, you're very clear. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> what's on your mind? Yeah. <laughs> We have uh, some more time, and we just want to know if people want to jump in and ask our panelists anything. Yes, sir. Our, uh, uh, yes. Hi, um, Zan. Yes. Very interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, the amount of feelings and passion that I'm seeing up there. Um, this is kind of a peacemaker question. I'm a musician, so I I, uh, I was very happy to hear uh, mention of Sun Ra. I feel like that's a there's some controversy on stage tonight with, amongst you, opinions that I heard. And what I'd like to ask is, uh, there was a saxophone player named John Gilmore who played with Sun Ra, who, um, and this goes to the, the point of there's unsung heroes that maybe the average person doesn't know about, that I know influenced John Coltrane a lot. And I haven't seen much written about John Gilmore. And some of you have you know, spent time with John Coltrane and so forth. I'd love to know more about John Coltrane's relationship with Sun Ra, specifically uh, John Gilmore. Uh, anybody in the audience who hasn't heard of John Gilmore should check him out. Um, and also, just, I'm a saxophone player, so just to mention that I've heard that John Coltrane read that he practiced a whole, whole lot. And so I'd like to hear uh, s s you speak about his dedication and his practice. Well, let's just one, sir, one question at a time. What's the first question? You had a John Sun Gilmore to Sun Ra. Yes. Anything about John yeah, Gilmore John, or Sun Ra? John Gilmore, just to, to share this with you. Uh, when I was with John and, and uh, asked him, uh, John, how do you feel 
about the fact that you're working so hard on your music and then uh, you look around and somebody is uh, duplicating your sound and your patterns and your music and they're running all the way to the bank. He said, I'm not concerned about that because by the time they get to the bank, I'm going to be thinking about something new. <laughs> and uh, this is the kind of mind that he had. Uh, he, I asked him, I said, who are the people who you like, who you think are, are credible as far as the music and the instrument is concerned? And John Gilmore was the first name that he came up with. And the second name was Frank Strozier. And nobody, well, very few people in the world would, would think that, that he was listening to everyone out there. He was a person who had his ear to the ground, who was listening to everything that happened, anything that was uttered, that he could learn or get something from, he was into it. So when you mentioned John Gilmore's name, that just brought to the, to me, the idea that he, John Gilmore was one of the people that he listened to also. Uh, Henry Grimes had a twin well, brother. Could, you, could someone, since we're, can you give us a mini biography? Who is John Gilmore? Should we know who it is? John Gilmore, uh, I'll let them, I'll let Reggie talk about that. Well, John Gilmore was a Chicago uh, saxophonist who came uh, to New York and became very, very, uh, famous, uh, not very famous, he became very active with Sun Ra's entourage. And he used to study with uh, Sun Ra. And uh, Sun Ra was a very learned man. He was, he was such a learned man that if I began to talk to you about some of the things that he would tell me about when I get off the bandstand with uh, John Coltrane's group and go to Sun Ra's loft and sit at his feet and listen to him talk, it would take days because he had so, and anything that he would tell you, he could give you a book to read to confirm it uh, because he had read all those books and he had studied all those things uh, that relate to that John uh, Marshall Allen, all the people who are close to uh, John, to uh, Sun Ra, understood what John Coltrane was doing, understood uh, what the need to, to develop as human beings is because that is the school that Sun taught all of the people who were involved with him. John was close to him as well. Patrick, yes indeed, uh, whose son became the mayor of, of Boston. Uh, there, there, there are people like uh, John Coltrane's friend Joe Brazil from Detroit who do you remember Joe Brazil? He was an uh, airplane mechanic, but he was a hell of a saxophonist and close to John uh, Coltrane. A uh, very, very astute man who was intelligent and really believed. Let me tell you, when the collective blood of God is, uh, if you all may just take another minute, did the, uh, the seminar at Billy Holiday Theater, uh, we had a whole month of activities there. I, I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember this, but Joe Brazil heard about this, and he came from where he was, I think he was in Seattle at that time, with trunks full of books. And he said, all you musicians have to know this. And he bought what kind of books? What kind of books? A small pamphlet that you get from the occult books there, if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. called The Musical Scale and the Scheme of Evolution. Do you remember? Uh, if you know Joe, you probably know that. This, this book was written by uh, a Rosicrucianist, uh, who, who uh, he's a German who became a Rosicrucianist, and he studied universal law, and he wrote a book about it. Some of the things in this, once you get past the first 12 pages where he got past his racist uh, ideas and started to do what he was ordained to do and, and begin to give us the information that we need to know, it's so much about humankind, about universal law, about how we are made molecularly and how the music affects us. As he talked about things like uh, each person having a particular sound 
uh, that your body relates to, why the Indians chant Aum, which you remember when John Coltrane uh, did Aum ha after having studied with the Hindus, and, uh, and most of the people who uh, taught him, uh, taught him the reason for the chant is because uh, when we chant certain notes, your certain fibers of your body respond to those notes, and if you have an ailment in your knee, then you chant the note that is related to that ailment, and that part of your body will vibrate and consequently be healed because of it. So those are things that are much beyond most of the learnings that we have. Well, um, uh, th this question seems to have gone in a rather esoteric direction. <laughs> oh, what is the perfect direction? Yeah, but, but no, but what is the connection to, uh, to Coltrane? Is you're saying that this was one of the, the uh, processes? Okay, so, so I'm going to talk a little bit, if that's all right, just for one second. I don't know what I'm supposed to have. So the reason that, thank you for your incredible answer. So the reason I said it was a bit of a peacemaker question was because there was controversy earlier about some statements would say, well, Coltrane is the first one to do this, and some other people argued with that point. And the reason this, this topic, Sun Ra and John Gilmore, for me is very, very important to bring up is Sun Ra was one of those, I mean, I'm not a historian, I'm not an academic, academician either, but Sun Ra was way ahead, way ahead. Ahead of? of in, in terms of this path of spirituality and searching for and patterns. So and, he was even ahead of, okay, of Coltrane. Yes. From from what I from what I know from what I know and what in any in any case the point I'm making is that there's a tradition there's a tradition it, it's there's not a whole lot of people that that were going in that direction let's say but there were some and I just I wanted to hear I wanted to hear about Train and Sun Ra because to me I love Supreme and Sun Ra's whole paradigm are like united mm. and and it and it's like Sun Ra was not uh, he's maybe not as well known I guess to people as love Supreme. I, I, I want to stop talking, but the last thing I want to say about John Gilmore is that when you hear John Gilmore playing with Art Blakey, you hear, I hear the sound of Coltrane. I hear Col I, I feel like Coltrane got his sound a, in a lot of ways from that part of John Gilmore. And then you can YouTube 20 years later and, and hear John Gilmore playing whistle, playing the craziest saxophone you ever heard in your life. It has nothing to do with that other tradition. It's just... I'm going to stop talking. It's okay, but well, well, thank you for that. Thank you. So we do all have precedents, and we all have mentors and so on. That was the purpose of my question. Anyone else? Yes. I, I, I'm not a historian either, but my brother did a six or seven hour documentary about a radio documentary about John Coltrane, Steve Rowland. Steve Rowland. Yeah. And, great, um, great piece of work. And one of the things that he says that, that he points out that I think was an answer to your question, Bill. Which I, question? The question about John Coltrane's politics and his yes. relationship to the mm -hmm. Times mm -hmm. is, and, and this is on YouTube, you can Google it and, and, and get to it. He shows the um, the cadence of Martin, the speech that Martin Luther King gave after the four little girls were killed in, in Birmingham, and John Coltrane's piece called Alabama, which he wrote, I think, shortly afterward, and he shows how he used the music in Martin Luther King's speech, and that became the basis for the melody of Alabama. I think you might have mentioned it also in your book, and I think there's no... I understand why um, why it's hard because he, he didn't give a lot of interviews and he didn't talk a lot. I think he really, why, why it might be hard to talk about his politics, but I think that shows that that might be an answer to your question. He was obviously very rooted in what was going on at the time. Mm -hmm. So and, I don't know and, if any of you want to talk about that. And the tune Alabama, thank you for mentioning this. The tune Alabama is not filled with outrage. It's a dirge. It doesn't have to be outrage. Yeah. But Did he have a, a political point of view is all I was asking. Well, one can absolutely feel how he felt about those times through the music. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if he is not one working with words, except in Love Supreme, mm -hmm. when he actually created a poem, and he has a letter to the listener, there's two parts 
you know, in the, uh, in the uh, interior cover of, of the album. But he's very clear in his music as to how he feels. Great. You know, that's great. I that's mean, great. you know, thank you for bringing this up because that is very direct connection to the times and to the outrage. But his reaction is, you know, I did this interview with Kamasi Washington and I asked him to bring one piece of music that was an inspiration for him. And he brought Alabama and mm -hmm. we played it. And he goes, now everyone knows the story about the four school children who were killed <laughs> in, the, in the bombing, you know, in, in, in Alabama and how outrageously evil that act was. And yet what, his, what he's doing musically is saying, take a moment, meditate, think about this. Mm -hmm. That seems to be what he's saying. At least that was Kamasi Washington. That's, that's fair. Know. Anyone else? Did you? Yes, sir. Hello. Thank you so much. Thanks for all of your insights. Thanks for your great questions. Um, I just want, I did see the performance in Philadelphia at the matinee. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that I want to bring to uh, You saw Love Supreme in Philadelphia. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I want to say to the audience, I don't know how the sound system is here, but in Philadelphia, it really emphasized uh, uh, Jimmy Garrison. And so I didn't. Uh, I heard usually when the first movement acknowledgement starts, it's boo 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 boo, and then he goes way away from that. <laughs> Try to listen to Jimmy Garrison all the way through the first movement. He's not playing that, but that motif over and over. Coltrane starts playing it in every key because he's saying God is everywhere. A love supreme is everywhere. So he's exploring all the different keys, and so. You see in the, in the choreography, you see searching everywhere, looking all over. So I just wanted to highlight that. The other thing I'd like to say is that we have a great Coltrane collector here, Yasu, Yasuhiro Fujioka, who's mm -hmm. um, featured in the latest documentary of John Coltrane. And I want to ask of him if he would share his interview with Ravi Shankar about John Coltrane's music, John Coltrane's music sounding angry and how Ravi Asked, um, well, now, were you asking him to play the interview? No, I'm at. Oh. If, he can, if he can, he, he did interview. Oh, please, please. I think I, he, were you also in St. John, John, John Coltrane? Yes, yes, yes. It's a great to have you here, sir. Yes. Yeah, um, thank you for a uh, great uh, uh, part of the discussion. I like them. And uh, I know uh, Reggie Markman and Ashley come many years. And uh, as he, she says, uh, mm -hmm. But I, I'm going to tell you, not uh, about the Rabbi Shankar, but uh, I believe uh, Allah Supreme completely no related with politics. But Alabama is very politic. But he, di he, that, he didn't want to say too much, but he, he involved his mind in the music uh, because uh, the four girls was 11 and 13 years old, uh, 14 years old. John Coltrane's stepdaughter, Saida, uh, was just 13 years, same uh, year of her stepdaughter. Uh, and also, uh, John Coltrane's paternal and maternal grandfather grand, uh, was a minister of the church. So that's why church bombing also the, the killed four girls, same age of his stepdaughter, was made him so angry. That's why he rushed to the studio. Uh, that was uh, October, uh, November 18, I think. Uh, but uh, five uh, days later, uh, <coughs> John F. Kennedy assassinated. So he didn't talk. He didn't want to talk too much. Even president was killed. You know, if he said too much. So he. But his music was uh, as always. Uh, Ashley Khan said so intense. You know. So. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> Japanese, so I can't say in, uh, enough English, but uh, uh, Alabama was so much, you know, related with the politics. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also the uh, Ravi Shankar, once I did my interview with him, and uh, I gave a tape to Dashri uh, when he made a, a book about Ravi Shankar. Uh, <laughs> he said, uh, uh, I was invited to the John Coltrane concert. Uh, probably that was the title of the tenor. Uh, February 1966, and he, John Coltrane played Orm. But 
<laughs> Om is a Hindu chant. Uh, Om Mani Padmi Om. Uh, because Ravi Shankar knows very well. But uh, this is not the Om. <laughs> Uh, Ravi Shankar preached to John Coltrane, this is not the music to make people happy or peace and love. So John Coltrane was so shocked and then he changed his mind. This is not the way of the, the music he is going. Uh, so uh, he decided to uh, be a disciple of the uh, Ravi Shankar. So Ravi Shankar prepared his studio in uh, California in 1967. Uh, waiting for Coltrane to training him, but he couldn't make it because he, he was ill and he, he died in 1967. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, there was, there was someone over there. We'll come right back. Hi, I just saw. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just following up with uh, the comment about Martin Luther King, I mean, there's some religious resonances to what he's doing, so there's a religious cadence to might be influenced by right. by Martin Luther King, but also, I mean, if you're just reading the liner notes, I mean, he's talking about psalms, which are a religious, specific religious form of music that mm -hmm. involves sometimes wailing, they involve lament, but he's emphasizing the, the uh, aspect of praise and thanksgiving. But, you know, especially with the end of Yom Kippur, I mean, the dissonance, I mean, <laughs> uh, of the Day of Atonement, I mean, I'm just wondering about the specifically uh, Jewish or Israelite resonances of the, the music itself? Well, that's an interesting question. Is there a Hebraic? Uh, uh, well, be, being one of the tribe myself, um, you know, I can tell you that I definitely, there's one or two phrases in the very last part of A Love Supreme, which is a prayer. It's rubato. He's basically reading a poem, the poem that's actually on the album cover through the saxophone. And he calls it song. And there's uh, two or three points that sound to me like a line, they could be lines from a Kaddish, you know, from a Jewish prayer. And I, I think the connection is that Mediterranean connection of the, you know, the blues, the flatted fifth, the, the scales that ended up in American blues and also in flamenco music in Spain and in, in uh, Eastern European Jewish music as well. That sort of uh, melancholy, you know, kind of feel. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Sarah. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. I wanted to ask about uh, an inverse of your question about understanding the uh, climate about uh, Mr. Coltrane in order to appreciate his music, and that is, the, his own personal evolution, particularly through drug addiction and alcoholism. Uh, drugs seem to play a big part in some of the lives of famous jazz musicians. And I wanted to know, A, what you think why that is, and does it take that kind of personal stripping away? Is it from complete um, heartbreak or physical breakdown that true genius then evolves? Because I think I read that after he overcame his addiction, he had this awakening. You know, that, you know this explosive question. I'm saying that was the critique know. against Ken Burns' documentary uh, from Jazz Figures, uh, that it was hackneyed. Uh, but gentlemen, do you want to take it on? I, mean, I think I can imagine. Uh, I can say this. I can answer a question. Yes, please. Uh, personally, they always say, why well, I look so good, the young ladies. They said, you must be a vegetarian not because, you know, they, that's prevalent out there. No, I'm a wino, an alcoholic. Yeah. And we're going to... And they said, that's a good one. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. But, okay. but, but I understand where you're coming from. It's a myth. It's a myth. It's a myth. Uh, it's a myth. Also, it's a myth. we it's a myth. all know it's a myth. that uh, mm -hmm. in the world of music, there's a lot of money in the ball with the music business and, and the drugs that were made available to the musicians. Excuse me, I were, see a lot of alcoholics here. I'm looking at them. I they, see a lot they, of them. They were, they, they were put out there for the musicians' uh, use in order to, to take them away from the business at hand and in order to be able to have them uh, dependent upon something by which they could be controlled. Uh, that was another thing, and I'd like to give you a parable. 
are if you think about children in the classroom and a teacher, I'll go back to the classroom again, a teacher in the classroom which has maybe uh, 20 children there and you have one very intelligent child and you have Sally with her pigtail sitting right in front of him and that intelligent child is not being challenged by the teacher. So that child dips Sally's big tails in the inkwell. That intelligent child throws spitballs and shoots stables across the room and does all kinds of things that they, he knows or she knows are not to be done. But that child is not being challenged mentally. Hence we have an intelligent person like Charlie Parker who is not being challenged mentally, so he put it put most of his, his intelligence to sleep and dealt with what was left for the society. Uh, we have uh, intelligent people who, uh, like Thelonious Monk, who, who, you can imagine all of the people who got caught with the drug situation because it was out there, it was presented to them, it was put to them, and they said, okay, I can do this and I can still function in this world. I can't well, Reggie, say that's you know, an you're, answer. You're, you're making them sound, the players sound very uh, passive, and uh, that, that there's a conspiracy, and that they are somehow, they're victims. Uh, I, anybody who's been through drug addiction, and there are different types of addiction, uh, one of the first things you have to do is admit your participation in it. <laughs> so I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but let's not infantilize uh, these men and women who fell into this. Yes, that, I agree with that statement. And my statement for saying, uh, using the parable of an intelligent child who's not being challenged and finding other things to do uh, is, is only a parable. And I think what you're saying is very true. We don't want to say, we don't want to give a person a reason or, or an excuse for being or who or, or where they are. Uh, life is life, and we are all humans, and we are all responsible for our own decisions. But the history tells us uh, many reasons why the ha things have happened. Some people got caught, some people did not. Most of my friends who got caught are not here today. Those of us who were able to say no, no are still on the planet. Uh, and we know that this is something that took us out, you know, that, that this is some reason whatever the, the vice may be, whether it be bending your elbow with alcohol, whether it be the spike or, or the nose or whatever the case may be, whatever the vice may be, uh, it can shorten your life as it did John Coltrane's life. Uh, the uh, cult, the uh, creative class is decimated for various reasons. Uh, there's a, and we're, we live in a culture right now where addiction is very much with us, uh, sexual addiction, Gambling addiction, there's all sorts of addiction. So, and I think the creatives are, and as I said, it's a very, we thank you for that, that, that uh, framing. Uh, how are we doing, folks? Have you, are you, uh, can we have, we have, uh, you know, yes, please. Hi. Um, right there, right, right behind you, please. Great. First of all, thank you so much for this really um, inspiring um, conversation about Coltrane. I've been a fan of um, his music for a long time. I will say that I'm, uh, uh, I have a background in anthropology and ethnomusicology, and my training had been in percussion, in African percussion. And I feel like I would be remiss when the discussion talked about um, John Coltrane's influences, that before um, his excursions into Eastern music with Ra Sun Ra and Ravi Shankar, um, there was a musician who he did look to for inspiration, and that was Baba Tunde Olatunji. And with the recording of Drums of Passion, which was um, you know, influential for uh, several generations of musicians, um, I know that Baba um, was very proud of his relationship with John. And I just wanted to share a funny story from my field work time in Africa um, when I was studying drums uh, and percussion. And in order to take time away from listening to um, you know, traditional African, West African um, tree and fanti music, I would take a break by listening to m the music of Coltrane and um, and uh, Miles Davis, and you know, just I had a collection of jazz with me. And uh, by chance, I ran into Baba uh, in Accra at the University of Ghana, 
and we had one of our rambling conversations, and he said, uh, Hortense, you know, what music are you listening to lately? And apologetically, I said, well, Baba, you know, I've been listening to so much drumming lately, so forgive me if I, if I don't say I've been listening to you. I, I've been listening to music that maybe you don't listen too much, so much to, I don't know. And he said, well, what have you been listening to? And I said, I, I've been listening to Coltrane. And he said, you mean you've been listening to Johnny? And I said, yeah. And he said, have you heard of a song called Tunji? Who do you think that was written after? <laughs> That's all I have to say. And, uh, and before we finish, I'd like to, uh, I, I don't know if I dare do this, the, uh, as you know, in that wonderful poem uh, that uh, the Love Supreme, um, there are three words that he says toward the end of the poem, and I'm going to ask our panelists to ask you one at a time, and, and the answer has to be like a sentence, if you could. The words are elation, elegance, exaltation, all from God. Elation, elegance, exaltation. Let's keep it short, because I think we're out of time. Anybody want to jump in? Yeah, you know, his superiority. His superiority. His superiority, yes. What about In the music. That's, that's what this is about? about Elation, it. elegance, exaltation? Yeah. His superiority. In music. Ah. Reggie. I would say he's telling us to realize that the music is, is, is the highest science and is the highest place, and, and resign yourself to it, and uh, develop yourself, and equip yourself to deal with it on the highest level. Mm -hmm. Shoot for the heavens. Shoot for the heavens. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been a pleasure.